How awesome is this place! I saw a ladder which rested on the ground with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were going up and down it. You will see greater things than this. You will see heaven wide open and God's angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You are the temple of the living God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. The temple of God is holy, and you are that temple. Beloveds, peace be with you. Let us proceed in peace.
seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is the Lord. Have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord, and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit.
the Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Almighty God, to whose glory we celebrate the dedication of this house of prayer, we give thee thanks for the fellowship of those who have worshipped in this place, and we pray that all who seek thee here may find thee, and be filled with thy joy and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from Ecclesiastes. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the first epistle general of St. John. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which, when a man hath found, he hideth and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea, and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down, and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth, and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. Then said he unto them, Therefore, every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In preparation for this glorious event, I read the entire tome titled St. Thomas Church, Fifth Avenue by the late, great J. Robert Wright. It was published in 2001 by St. Thomas Church and the William E. Erdman's Publishing Company. In that book, Dr. Wright quotes a pamphlet published in 1824 reprinted on the inside cover of your bulletin, which reads, on Sunday evening, 12 October, 1823, notice thereof having been previously given in some of the public papers, divine service, according to the rites of the Protestant Episcopal Church, was celebrated for the first time in the large room number 440, Broom Street, corner of Broadway, by the Reverend Dr. Wainwright, rector of Grace Church. Nearly all of the Episcopal clergy of the city being present, after which 
a discourse by the Reverend Cornelius R. Duffy from Psalm 87, verse 2. Now, for those of us who have not memorized the entire book of Psalms, and I say that hesitantly because maybe somebody, some, some of you people here have, but for those of you who have not, Psalm 87, verse 2 reads, The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. And I wonder whether the Reverend Mr. Duffy would have referenced verses 1 and 3 as well, giving verse 2 its context. The whole reads, On the holy mount stands the city he founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. The Reverend Mr. Duffy was officially named the first rector of St. Thomas Church in 1824, but his time in that position was relatively brief. Tragically, Mr. Duffy contracted typhoid fever and died on August 20th, 1827. Yet even though his rectorship was short, in everything I have read, Duffy is remembered as a beloved figure, a leader, inspirational, humble, and faithful to Almighty God and the fledgling congregation of St. Thomas. Your current rector, the Reverend Canon Carl F. Turner, his spouse, Mother Allison Turner, and the incredible leadership team currently serving this exquisite parish, has continued the tradition of bringing out of our treasure things new and old. Joined by a great cloud of witnesses, we now arrive at a very particular moment in time when we come together to celebrate a 200-year narrative that has incorporated many transformations along the way, including two devastating fires and relocation from downtown to midtown. Given the rich tapestry of history and events that comprises St. Thomas Church at 200, what pieces of treasure can we reflect on this evening that will provide some small sustenance as we celebrate coming this far and take some nourishment for the days ahead. I suggest we reflect on three words which characterize the story of St. Thomas Church. Balance, beauty, and beloved. These three words do not even come close to describing the entire life of the parish. Yet the words name aspects or dynamics of its life that are central, core values, if you will, which infuse the life of St. Thomas with the bold power of God's Holy Spirit. When we talk about balance, a host of associations occur. The dictionary I have on my desk at home offers 25 definitions and then further names such specifics as balance of power, balance of trade, and balance sheet. Treasurers take note. The essence of the concept is that somehow there is an equal distribution of power or weight or wealth. Balance names a static situation, but seeking balance can indicate a constantly moving back and forth that can be seen as small as two children on a seesaw and as large as the swing of a giant pendulum. In fact, if we think of a pendulum in a mechanical clock, 
we see that the pendulum must move back and forth if the clock is to tell time and the passage of time. And yet, the pendulum responds to both gravity and inertia, and so, in a mechanical clock at least, keeps swinging. The 200-year story of St. Thomas Church reveals an early testing ground for the 19th and 20th century fight between high and low churchmanship in the Episcopal Church. St. Thomas' history includes times of discernment, of mission, and focus. Are we to serve the rich or the poor? The immediate surrounding area or move beyond reaching out to the larger community? Does St. Thomas Church name the building or the people? You will, of course, recognize that these are false choices based on dichotomies of our own making. But my own reading of the history of St. Thomas indicates that this part of the body of Christ in the world has always sought the equilibrium of balance without abnegating its prayerfully discerned identity. And that dynamic of seeking balance is one of the life streams of this church. The lesson from Ecclesiastes speaks of many kinds of balance in life. And the gospel is for and about the rich and the poor. We can have and offer the world a beautiful building and understand the people as the body of Christ. We can serve the needs of the immediate neighborhood and reach out beyond our immediate life. Balance. I worked hard on the balance part of this sermon. Speaking about beauty in relation to St. Thomas is practically effortless. From the ethereal music sung by the St. Thomas choir of men and boys with the modus operandi orchestra to the sight of the exquisite stained glass windows, the magnificent reredos, to the smell of sweet incense, to the taste of good food and drink, to the feel and sense of fellowship in liturgy and worship, St. Thomas has long been characterized by beauty. Beauty surrounds us right here and right now, and the world is in such need of beauty. Sometimes we find ourselves needing to justify the expense of energy or money into supporting beauty. But the beauty of God's world is not a luxury. It's a necessity, especially in times of great ugliness and despair. When I think about the need for beauty, I am reminded of the bread and roses strike from January until March of 1912 in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Led mostly by women textile workers, the strike was remarkable for at least two things. It was peaceful and ended without injury, and it united dozens of immigrant communities under the leadership of the industrial workers of the world. James Oppenheim coined the slogan, Bread and Roses, in a poem first published in 1911, and the slogan was picked up by the strikers in Lawrence in 1912. Oppenheim's poem was set to music in 1976 by Mimi Farina and was made famous by Judy Collins's recording of it. The music and the lyrics tell the story of the 1912 strike and the ongoing struggle for human dignity and matters of the heart, as well as adequate food, clothing, and shelter, and humane working conditions. The song is a marching song, 
And one verse goes like this. As we go marching, marching, we bring the greater days. The rising of the women means the rising of the race. No more the dredge and idler, ten that toil where one reposes, but a sharing of life's glories, bread and roses, bread and roses. Our lives shall not be sweated from birth until life closes. Hearts starve as well as bodies. Bread and roses, bread and roses. We all need bread and we all need roses too. Balance, beauty, beloved. I'm tempted to go directly to the epistle lesson and quote the writer of 1 John and leave it at that. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. God is love, love is God, love one another. But that would be too easy. And while the lesson assures us that God loves us first, and we love God in response to that first love, and gave Jesus to show us the way, I believe we really need to look at the gospel lesson to learn something about how we build the beloved community or the kingdom of heaven, as the gospel writer Matthew puts it. We can receive some guidance from Jesus himself and the gospel lesson. Matthew's Jesus is teaching his disciples about the kingdom of heaven and what it's like. The kingdom of heaven which Jesus teaches about and the beloved community which we are trying to build are similar in nature, if not the same. Jesus says, and forgive me here, I'm going to translate the King James Version into the New Revised Standard Version so that I can try to speak without spitting. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea. Going back a few verses in Matthew's gospel, we can add Jesus saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in their branches. And the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. A colleague of mine recently noted that if there was only one way to God, Jesus would have only told one parable. But he doesn't. The kingdom of heaven is like this, or this, or this, or this, or this. And let me tell you a story about that. In an attempt to be as exhaustive and reach as many people as possible. You there, the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl of great price. That doesn't work for you? Okay. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. No? All right. The kingdom of heaven is like a net cast into the sea. Then we have to ask, is the kingdom of heaven really like a mustard seed, like yeast, like treasure, like a pearl, like a net? No, not exactly. The grammatical structure of the Greek indicates that a better translation of all of these little parables would be, it is the case with the kingdom of heaven as with a mustard seed, or as with a little yeast. Can you hear the difference? The emphasis in each parable is not meant to be placed on the object itself. 
The purpose of each parable is to compare the kingdom of heaven with the final stage of the process therein described. So, the kingdom of heaven is not exactly like a mustard seed. What the kingdom of heaven is like is the tree that the, that the seed eventually becomes. The kingdom of heaven is not exactly yeast. What it's like is the risen dough when the yeast has permeated the whole thing. The kingdom of heaven is not like treasure hidden in a field. It is, the, it is like the response made to finding the treasure hidden in the field. Likewise, the kingdom of heaven is not like the pearl of great value. It's like the response of the merchant in search of fine pearls. And finally, the kingdom of heaven is not exactly like a net thrown into the sea, but the situation at the coming of the kingdom is compared to the sorting out of the fish caught in the net. Take note. We're getting some instructions on how to build beloved community. With all of these parables, but perhaps particularly with the treasure hidden in the field and the pearl of great value, Jesus seems to be saying that God sometimes acts in hidden ways. Paradoxically, God sometimes reveals God's self through that which is concealed but discoverable. Sometimes God acts in hidden ways. Jesus himself is a living instance of this. The eyes of civilization were seeking for power, creativity, and change, and they're all fixed on Rome. Yet it is away from that focus where God acts. Rome is not the divine center. It is Bethlehem. Jewish tradition looks to a Messiah who will come with power and charisma to conquer. But here comes a village carpenter. Instead of seeking his following at the center of power in Jerusalem, he remains secluded in the hills of Galilee. Instead of outlining a political plan, he speaks of a kingdom concealed in the human heart and in the designs of God. When finally he submits to the terrible wheel of history that revolves to crush him, he lies sheltered in the tomb and then emerges as conqueror of death. God sometimes acts in hidden ways. If indeed God works this way, then we are wise always to presume the possibility of God's activity in places that are hidden. If we regard an area of life as ordinary and everyday and pedestrian, then let us beware. Mustard seeds lie in dirt, waiting for the sun and a little water to free them up to grow. If we come to take relationships for granted, then let us be careful. Under ordinary fields, there may be treasure. If colleagues at work or the place itself or its tasks have begun to feel soul-destroying, it is just possible that somewhere hidden in that situation is an element which can become an entry point into new possibilities and a door into the beloved kingdom. As St. Thomas Church continues seeking ways to build that beloved community, know that in addition to the treasures that appear obvious, there are some hidden treasures that have yet to be revealed. They can pop up at any time maybe even tonight. The treasure you've been seeking might be sitting right next to you. The pearl of great price might be the one you've been looking at for low these many years yet have not recognized 
its great value. The net cast into the sea has drawn us all together this evening, but I sense that our purpose and call will move us beyond this celebration to cast that net again and again and again. Balance, beauty, beloved. These are words that describe, at least in part, St. Thomas Church. They are words that can help guide us as we continue to seek the kingdom of heaven and build the beloved community. Recognizing that, the balance, beauty, and beloved nature already here, St. Thomas Church can do what it does best, bring out of that rich treasure what is new and what is old to the honor and glory of God. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us thank God whom we worship here in the beauty of holiness. Eternal God, the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, much less the walls of temples made with hands. Graciously receive our thanks for this place and accept the work of our hands offered to thy honor and glory. 
for the church universal of which these visible buildings are the symbol. We thank you, Lord. For thy presence whenever two or three have gathered together in thy name. We thank you, Lord. For this place where we may be still and know that thou art God. for making us thy children by adoption and grace, and refreshing us day by day with the bread of life. We thank you, Lord. For the knowledge of thy will and the grace to perform it. We thank you, Lord. For the fulfilling of our desires and petitions as may be most expedient for us. We thank you, Lord for the pardon of our sins, which restoreth us to the company of thy faithful people. We thank thee, Lord. For the blessing of our vows and the crowning of our years with thy goodness. We thank thee, Lord. For the faith of those who have gone before us and for our encouragement by their perseverance. We thank thee, Lord for our fellowship with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. Thomas, our patron, and all thy saints. We thank you, Lord. O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord. Peace to this house from God our Heavenly Father. Peace to this house from His Son who is our peace. Peace to this house from the Holy Spirit, the life giver. Beloveds, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And with thy spirit. Let us offer to one another a sign of peace. Please be seated. A very warm welcome to St. Thomas Church, Fifth Avenue, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to those of you who are joining us around the world today via the live stream. I know that we have people around the world who've been in touch with us. Some of you, I know, are uh, meant to be in bed. Anyway, it's good to have you with us today. Uh, a brief word about Holy Communion. W that, uh, all baptized Christians are welcome to receive Holy Communion in the Episcopal Church on this special day. If you wish to receive Communion, please follow the direction of the ushers. We're going to have just one station here at the center of the nave, so follow, uh, just come along the center aisle here. There'll be three uh, ministers with the host and six chalices, so there's plenty of time. Take your time to come to Communion. If you would prefer to receive a blessing, just carry your service um, booklet with you to the uh, minister. And if you prefer to remain in your seat, that's fine also. You do not have to receive on the chalice, but we do ask that you do not try and dip the host into the chalice. Uh, we don't do that in this diocese. Two hundred years ago, a small group of Christians gathered not in a great Gothic church or cathedral, but as Bishop Mary has reminded us, in a room. No choir, no stained glass, no jewel book of the Gospels, but they did have the Scriptures, they had the Book of Common Prayer, they had each other, and of course they had a vision. The book of Proverbs says, where there is no vision, the people perish. It is that vision 
I think we celebrate this night. That's why your sermon was so apposite for us, Mary. Thank you so much. You've been such an encouragement to us at St. Thomas and to me personally, and I'm very grateful for your ministry, and thank you for your words today. Um, it's great also to have, of course, um, our diocesan bishop, Bishop Dietschy, with us here today. Thank you for your continuing support and encouragement to our parish. And it's wonderful, isn't it? We've got all our bishops of the diocese and our next bishop here too, and retired bishops. Some, uh, one has come a very, very long way. Bishop Marshall is, Michael Marshall is here, who has traveled 3,500 miles just for this celebration. So that's how much we're held uh, as a beloved community around the world. And also Bishop O'Hara representing the Roman Catholic Archdiocese and the Cardinal who sends his wishes to us. It's so good to have ecumenical uh, guests with us. And of course our Rector Emeritus, Father Andy Mead, how lovely. He said to me, I used to sit John Andrew there and now I'm sitting, <laughs> now I'm sitting you there. <laughs> um, anyway, um, all of you parishioners, ambassador, um, guests, uh, from far and wide, uh, it's wonderful to have you here with us tonight. Immediately after the service, which is going to be long, so, um, you know, get ready for, uh, you know, it's not that often I keep you in church this long, but it's, hey, it'll be another 200 years before we do this. So, um, <laughs> but we have got a treat. We've got a wonderful uh, reception afterwards with lots of food and, and uh, drink. So please do stay on afterwards at the back of the church, though I think if you're going to stay for the reception, it would be a kindness to the organist to wait until he's finished playing the voluntary before you start um, enjoying yourselves too much. Our celebration continues. Tomorrow there is a free concert here with the Choir of Men and Boys and the St. Thomas Brass. And I look forward to many of you uh, on Saturday at the Black Tie Fundraiser Gala, at which Bill Hass, who read The Prayers of the People, will be presented with the inaugural Vestry Medal of Honor. On Sunday, we will have one choral celebration in the morning at the time of 10 a.m. So please rem pretend your clocks are changing or something. It's 10 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, and our preacher will be our very own Rector Emeritus, Father Andy Mead. Then we're going to have brunch together because, yes, this night is not enough. So you have to stay in church all weekend. And uh, uh, we've got a really good brunch uh, on Sunday. And then at 2.15, we're going to have a beautiful organ recital on the Taylor Booty organ in the gallery, which is going to be manually pumped so it'll have real breath. Uh, and the day finishes at uh, 3 p.m. Note the time, 3 p.m., with um, Evensong and a solemn Te Deum, at which our preacher will be the sub-dean of His Majesty's Chapel Royal from St. James's Palace in London. Uh, at this wonderful moment, I'm delighted to announce the opening of our, <coughs> excuse me, of our bicentennial exhibition, Art in the Service of Faith. Take a walk through the back of the south of the narthex and into the Chantry Chapel where the exhibition is installed. It's been an extraordinary collaboration by a group of parishioners, staff, and professionals. The exhibition was curated by Inga Reist and Fran Bluin, both longtime parishioners. Fran is also our archivist, and Inga serves on the vestry. The exhibition was designed by a team of professionals from Think Design, led by George Martinez and Eric Lindvelt, with the lighting design by Sarah Lurie of the lighting practice. Finally, Pam Zonzius and Fred Zonzius managed all the details and logistics that made it seem to happen so effortlessly. Thank all of you for all your hard work. Now, finally, we had hoped that the mayor of New York our great city would be able to be with us. He, this morning he was still hoping to be with us. He's been called away. Uh, instead, he has sent us a proclamation he has issued to the city, which will be read by our warden, Gregory Zafira. The City of New York Office of the Mayor, October 12th, 2023. Religious communities across the five boroughs are essential threads in the rich cultural tapestry that unites and sustains New Yorkers. 
and they remind us of our responsibility to lift one another up every day. The values of compassion and generosity for which our city is known have long been upheld by the many houses of worship that become pillars in their communities. In that spirit, today I am pleased to join in celebrating the bicentennial of the first meeting of Manhattan's St. Thomas Church. New Yorkers take immense pride in their city's vibrant coalition of faith communities that inspire others to act with charity, kindness, and love. Over the past 200 years, St. Thomas Church, whose earliest parishioners first met in a modest room on Broom Street and Broadway before moving to its current location in a French Gothic masterpiece at the heart of Midtown Manhattan, has been an integral part of New York's spiritual and cultural communities. Whether it's 1823 or 2023, this venerable house of worship's church family has always been powered by faith, friendship, and fellowship. Faith is the driving force of any great mission, and my administration is committed to ensuring that people of all belief and cultures feel respected, safe, and welcome in our city. I am proud to count St. Thomas Church as an ally in this mission and applaud its leadership and parishioners for its tremendously positive impact on so many New Yorkers. Together, we will forge a better, brighter future for all. Sincerely, Eric Adams, Mayor of the City of New York. Marvelous. Let's give them <laughs> Mr. Adams, if you are watching online or on the On Demand, thank you for that proclamation. Now we have to do something very special. Dr. Phil Sell. Yeah. This is another parable of the kingdom. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. very meet, right and abundant duty, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee. O Lord, Holy Father, almighty everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our great High Priest, in whom we are built up in as living stones of a holy temple, that we might offer before thee a sacrifice of praise and prayer, which is holy and pleasing in thy sight. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying,
All glory be to thee, almighty God, our heavenly Father, for that thou of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. <clears throat> Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, we thy humble servants do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these are gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, 
and be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this, our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offences. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now, as our Saviour Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him that taketh away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. On this special anniversary here in New York, we now invite those of you around the world to make an act of spiritual communion as we make our Holy Communion, and to invite Jesus under your own roof and into your heart. May the body of Christ bring me to everlasting life. Blood of Christ be the lasting life.
dost assure us thereby of thy faith and goodness towards us, and that we are very members in corporate, in the mystical body of thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship, and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honour and glory, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with our spirit. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who hath made heaven and earth. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth The blessing, mercy, and grace of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.
Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit.